This morning, you take your copy of God's Word. You can open it to the book of Ecclesiastes found in the Old Testament, the third chapter, and also we'll be turning over into the Gospel according to John, the fourth chapter. In Ecclesiastes, we'll be reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. In the Gospel of John, we'll be looking at the fourth chapter, verses 4 through 15. To honor the reading of God's Word, if you're physically able, let's stand. More than likely, this is King Solomon, who was considered one of the wisest men of all time, says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to plant and there's a time to uproot. There's a time to kill and there's a time to heal. There is a time to tear down and a time to build. There is a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. There's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to search and there's a time to give up. There's a time to keep and there's time to throw away. There's a time to tear and there's a time to mend. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. There's a time for love and there's a time to hate. There's a time for war and also there is a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in human's heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Now let's look in the gospel according to John. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you speak to me and ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God who it, and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him if he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it, as did also his sons and livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And this is the word of God for the people of God. And may God add his blessings to the reading of his holy inspired word, and all God's people together said. Thank you. you. may be seated. A medical doctor was talking to his friend one day, and he said this. So there's a disease that no knife and no drug will ever touch. And his friend looked at him kind of perplexed and said, well, are you, are you talking about cancer? No, I'm not talking about cancer. He said, I, I believe we'll find a cure for cancer one day. And what are you talking about, heart disease? He said, no, we're making advancements uh, with the human heart on a daily basis. He said, the disease that I am talking about is the disease of boredom. Isn't it amazing how many of us get bored? How many times we hear that word, bored? Your children will look at you on a beautiful spring day or a beautiful summer day about 3 o'clock and they'll say, I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. But it's not just children. It's not just young people. What happens is this. We get caught up in the routineness of life and life becomes monotonous. It becomes so daily. 
for instance, a young man or a young woman can dream of, of going off to college, earning a degree, finding a profession that they can dedicate their lives to. And, and they go to college, and this is what happens. There are endless classes to attend, countless papers to take, books to be read and, and tests to take. And before you know it, this this pursuit of knowledge becomes monotonous, and it becomes boring. There are others who dream of becoming doctors, lawyers, teachers, bankers, accountants, businessmen, other professionals. They, They complete their education, and then they get a job. And before too long, that job becomes routine. You do the same thing over and over, day after day. And life becomes boring. One medical doctor quit a very lucrative practice. And this is the reason he gave. I got tired of looking down people's throats every day. You see, the repetitiveness of life became overwhelming. They're strange birds, kind of like myself, that, that enter into the ministry. We have this dream of hoping to, to advance the kingdom of God. We, we want to spread the good news and see lives change. But before too long, we all become disillusioned because the church is made up of imperfect people. And then there's the thought that runs through our mind, do people really want spiritual depth? Do we really want to grow in our faith? Do we really want to advance in our knowledge of what God wants us to do? And after a while, a pastor or a minister can feel absolutely positively drained by the people because you feel as though they're sucking the very life out of you, and sometimes there are churches that are never satisfied. And before you know it, A minister looks up, puts his hands in the air and says, it's just not worth it. And he quits, walks away. How many of you are married? Most of you in here. Do you remember when you were dating your spouse? I mean, everything was exciting, wasn't it? I mean, you drive a hundred miles just to see that girl or that guy. I mean, you would spend hours in front of a mirror because you wanted everything to look perfect from the makeup to the hair to the perfume to the outfit to the cologne or whatever it was. And then you get married. And you're thinking, you know what? This is going to be like a perpetual date. It's always going to be exciting. And then the routineness of life begins to settle in. And you get bored with each other. And you start thinking, oh, you know what? We need children. That'll pep things up. And then the children start arriving. And you know what it does? It adds fuel to the fire. And you begin to think, you know, what did we ever talk about Before we had children. And what did we ever do with our time? And married life becomes so routine. Why? Because there are dishes to be washed. There are clothes to be folded. There are bills to be paid. Yards to be mowed. And beds to be made up. And before too long, it's a never-ending cycle of doing the same thing over and over and over again. You see, I am thoroughly convinced today that boredom is at the heart of many of our problems in society. I mean, think about it. Why do people turn to drugs or alcohol? We get bored. We want to experiment with something that can be exciting. We want something that that can give us a little uh, bolt, if you will, of energy and see things in a different light. 
It's why people turn to crime. It's why people have affairs. People need some excitement in their life. The writer of Ecclesiastes was no different. More than likely, it is King Solomon who was the wisest man who had ever lived. As a matter of fact, when he had a conversation with God, God said, Solomon, I am going to grant you whatever you want. Think about that. Almighty God asking an individual, what do you want? And Solomon says, give me wisdom and give me knowledge. And God said, because you have been wise in your choice, I'm going to grant it to you. But even Solomon, as smart as he was and as wise as he was, began to look at life and he says, life is boring. It's an ever chase after the wind. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. What he was saying was this. Life doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. Life becomes daily. Think about it. The same thing over and over again. I saw a postcard that had this big, huge ball on it and a little bitty snail on top of that ball. And the snail says, slowly but surely, I'm getting nowhere fast. I can assure you that there are a lot of people in this room today that have thought the same thing. You look at your life and you're thinking, is this all there is to it? I'm getting nowhere fast. In the comic strip, Hagar the Horrible, Hagar's wife is standing before him and she's got a mop in one hand and she's got a bucket in the other hand. There are clothes that are scattered around her that need to be folded. And she looks at him and said, you promised me a life of luxury when your ship came in. He said, you're right, I did. She said, it sunk, didn't it? For many of us, we feel like our ships have sunk. We've hit this dead end at the end of the street. We're wondering, do we turn to the right or do we turn to the left? If we go to the right, is it going to be any different? If we go to the left, are we going to find meaning there? Well, for a moment, let's look in John's gospel at a story that we had this past week, actually, in Vacation Bible School. Wiley taught this to our fifth and sixth graders, and while he was teaching, I said, how appropriate is this? Our young people are getting this lesson uh, this week during VBS Our adults are going to get it on Sunday morning. I think this story helps us to kind of overcome a little bit this disease that you and I know as boredom. And I want you to notice the very first thing that this text says. It says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now that word, had, is more of a theological description than it is geographical. Jesus could have bypassed Samaria because most every Jew did. Now, this is what you have to remember. You you, you have Palestine here. And and, and in Palestine, you have Galilee to the north. You have Judea to the south. Right smack dab in the middle for about 120 miles, you know what you have? You have Samaria. Now, Samaria was made up of the, of course, Samaritans that were half Jews, half Gentiles. They were considered half-breeds to the Jews. And Jews would never associate with a Samaritan. And I find it interesting that it tells us Jesus had to go through Samaria. In other words, Jesus had to show that the gospel is always inclusive and never exclusive. So Jesus comes to the town of Sychar there in Samaria, and he sits down by what is known as Jacob's well. And a lady comes to him at noon to draw water. Now Jesus, secondly, waits 
at the well. He simply waits. Why? For obvious reasons. Number one, he's tired. The disciples had gone off to buy food for them to eat. And here we clearly see the humanity of Jesus. Folks, listen to me. The earliest heresies about Jesus were not that he wasn't fully God. The early heresies about Jesus was he wasn't fully man. And right here, we see the humanity of our Lord and Savior. John, in in his writing, said this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God knows how you feel through his son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus was fully man and experienced everything that you experience. I mean, there are times in our lives when we are facing difficult situations or we're going through a hard time in life, we want to shake our fist up at God and say, you don't know how it feels. And God says, yes, I do. I know exactly how it feels because I was there and I've done it. But there's a greater truth that we need to grasp here in this story, and that is this. Our God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, who hurled the stars in the sky, who created you and me, is a God who can wait. Our God is a God of infinite patience. However, you and I by nature are impatient people. We have a hard time waiting, don't we? Patience is a virtue that I'm not blessed with. I I, I have about this much. And you see, it's getting worse in our society because everything's instant, isn't it? I mean, you take a picture on your cell phone It's on Instagram, Facebook, it's almost Twitter. It is there in a matter of seconds, isn't it? It's instant. The best invention that I think has been made in the last 24 years is the Keurig coffee machine. You can have a freshly brewed cup of coffee just in a matter of minutes. One cup, too. So you don't waste anything. It's not like that old Sanka that we used to drink. Absolutely awful stuff. You know, we go through drive-ins now. Drive in at the bank. Drive through at the fast food restaurant. Everything is instant and we hate to stand in line. Unlike God, you and I are not very good at waiting. We're always in a hurry. We don't want to miss much in life. But God waits, and he waits for you this morning as well. Secondly, or third, notice this. While Jesus is waiting, a woman comes to the well in the very routine part of her life. Now, you got to remember, in that day and time, they didn't have running water. And this was a trip that took place more than likely Every day, the woman was responsible for going to the well to get water to drink, to bathe with, to cook with. You see, this was something that was repetitive. And much of what we do in life is repetitive. I mean, think about your life. You wake up in the morning, you eat breakfast, have a cup of coffee, get in the car, drive to work, You come home, eat supper, as my dad would say, sit in front of the idiot box for about an hour or so, watch something on TV. Then you go to bed, get up the next morning, what happens? Cycle starts all over again. For some of us, our jobs are repetitive, monotonous. We do the same thing over and over. My grandfather was a rural mail carrier in Louisville, Mississippi. That's what he did. He delivered the mail every day. Just suppose my grandfather back then got up one day and said, "Mm, I don't think I'm going to deliver the mail today. I don't think it's going to happen. 
I, I, I'm just going to take the day off. I mean, think about the people who do the same thing over and over. What if they just decided not to do their work? If a farmer who does the same thing over and over just decides one day, I'm not going to do it. Or a banker. Or a computer technician. Y'all may not know this, but Boyd Lennon has just bought Sansing Tire. So if you need tires, go to Sansing Tire. That's 150 bucks that just cost you, Boyd. But I got to thinking about this. He's got these guys that change tires, right? He sells tires. Good price on tires, too. Go see boy. Anyway, what if his workers just decided, boy, we're not changing any tires today. We've done the same thing over and over and over. We're just not going to do it. What effect does that have on others? You see, the routine things that we do sometimes have bigger results than what we think. I mean, there are a lot of people that question the importance of their work. Have you ever just stopped and thought, what I do makes no difference at all? What I do makes no difference at all. But you see, some of the greatest contributions that have ever been made in life have come through people who were just working and continued to work. They were diligent at their jobs. I mean, Thomas Edison didn't one day just decide, I'm just going to invent electricity. He worked repetitively over and over and over and over. And there are many people who work hard every day with no praise and no reward, yet they're making a difference. When I was pastoring at First Baptist Church of Canton, one of my deacons was the headmaster at Canton Academy. And whenever I would just kind of want to yank his chain a little bit, whenever I would kind of want to give him a little bit of encouragement but have a little fun, I would call him up. I'd say, Mike? How's the day going? Well, it's going okay. I said, are they lined up at your door telling you what a good job you're doing? He said, no, and it's never happened. And so there are a lot of people who are working diligently. They're working hard, but nobody ever says anything about what a wonderful job you're doing. Have you ever thought about how commonly God came into this world he came into this world not in a palace but he came where in a stable laid in a manger he lived among common people for most of his life Jesus lived in poverty when Jesus taught the parables that he taught he taught parables about farmers he taught Parables about seeds, about birds, sheep, and shepherds. Common things that illustrated what the kingdom of God was like. Think for a moment how the ministry of the church is done. It's not done by the pastors and the ministers of music and the ministers of youth alone. It's done by people. That was evident this past week. We had vacation Bible school. If you were relying on us to do vacation Bible school, probably wouldn't have gotten off the ground but there were people here that were making a difference you saw that on the powerpoint presentation snacks recreation bible study people that made sets people that did arts and crafts people that did music sunday what we do here there's a lot of things that go into this service you know on thursday we're trying to get you an outline and an order of service in the midst of doing vacation bible school this week you don't think that lisa and Chantel sometimes don't get tired of running orders of service that you take for granted and when you see a mistake you go you made a typo here you misspelled a word here and they're just trying to get the thing out so that you can have information. Tonight, our deacons will meet. 
and they will talk about spiritual matters. That's what our deacons do, isn't it, Boyd? We're not a policy-making group. We were never meant to be a board of deacons. We have a body of deacons who are concerned with carrying out the spiritual needs of the church. Common things that are done by folks that are working diligently in the background. This choir didn't just happen to say, let's just sing this song today. They work week after week, practice over and over and over. The nursery workers are back there in the background. Mel is back here in the background. People who are making an impact on the kingdom who never get one word of praise. Listen closely to this. When everything we do seems ordinary, then we lose our awareness of its uncommon significance. Not everything that we do is just ordinary. Some of the greatest things done for the church are things which seem so routine and they make a huge difference. I love this. You can write this down. This is a really, really good sentence. If you do small things as if they were great things, then God will enable you to do great things as if they were small things. Think about that for a moment. If you do small things as if they were great things, then God will enable you to do great things as if they were small things. But continue with me and notice that when this lady came to the well, it was in a day's routine But she got a new perspective. Our text says that she came at noon. Do you find that interesting? Has it ever crossed your mind that's interesting that she came at noon? You would normally think that she would come when? Say it. Why would she come early in the morning? It's cooler, wasn't it? One is hot, but here she comes in the heat of the day. All right? Was there a reason? What was the reason? Yeah, she had been ostracized by the community. You know, when she's there, Jesus had a conversation. We didn't read it, but Jesus has a conversation with her and says, Woman, where's your husband? And she goes, uh, don't have one of those. He said, you're right. I've had about five. And the guy you're living with now, you're just shacking up with him. That's what Jesus says. He tells her everything about her and yet never judges her. I'm going to say that again. She's living in sin, correct? Isn't she? She Say yes. Oh, thank you. Come on. I want to make sure you're listening. She's living in sin. She's she's living with the guy that's not her husband. And whether you want to you you like that or not, it's it's wrong. It's something you shouldn't do. And Jesus, the only person who is qualified to judge her, what? He doesn't. He speaks to her, which no Jewish man would speak to a woman in public, much less a Samaritan woman in public. And he speaks to her. Here she is alone. But the woman almost misses the most important lesson. Jesus says, you know, the water that I give you is living water and you'll never thirst again. You know what she does? She starts debating him. (laughs) She starts debating him. Which ought to tell us never never go to a gunfight with a knife. You know, you'll lose that one every time. 
Don't, don't try to debate with God. You're, you're, you're not going to win that one. And this is what she says. We worship here on the mountains. The Jews worship at the temple. Where do you think we ought to worship? You see, too often in the church, we want to argue about things that aren't important. We become critical in the church over things that really aren't that important. We become negative and allow negativity to creep into our lives and into our minds. And before you know it, we've taken our eyes off of what is the most important thing. Listen closely. Because I'm here to tell you, some of you need to hear this. Somebody once said that it takes seven positive comments to overturn one negative comment. It takes seven positives to just overturn and bring the scales back to even over one negative thing. You don't know why so many churches are struggling today? I can tell you why so many struggle. People want their way. Folks, listen to me. There's my way, there's your way, and there's God's way. God's way better be the only way you're trying to live. This woman almost missed the most important thing because, and so do we, we're looking for the spectacular or the theatrical rather than the ordinary. Jesus always avoided Listen closely. Jesus always avoided having the spotlight become on the presentation. Now, I, I got to tell you, now, I don't mean to be judgmental. And I want you to hear my heart today, okay? But I look at some churches today, and I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, God help us when, when worship becomes about us. And it becomes entertainment. When it becomes entertainment and we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, have strobe lights and we make it into this theatrical production rather than a worship experience, then something's wrong. I, I heard a pastor say, you know, worship is about how you feel. Folks, that's theologically incorrect. Worship doesn't have anything to do with how you feel. Worship is what you do for God. And worship is more than just this time that we spend on Sunday mornings. Worship is your act of living sacrifice that you present to the Savior every day. That is your spiritual act of worship. But when we co congregate like this collectively as a group, it is an audience of one, and when we leave here, the first thing that ought to cross through our mind is this. Was God pleased with my response today? Was God pleased with what we did? Not it sure was good today. I want worship to be good. I want worship to be first class because I believe God deserves our best. But this is not about you. This is not about me. Jesus, whenever he would heal somebody, what would he say? Don't do a tale. Don't tell. Don't tell. You see, he was trying to get away from the spotlight. When he was tempted by Satan, remember what Satan said? Just throw yourself off the temple and let the angels come and bring you to safety. That would have been pretty spectacular, wouldn't it? But it's interesting to me that this well, which was a place of repetitive 
functions. It became a shrine when this woman met Jesus. God can turn any place where we meet him into a shrine. Moses was on a mountaintop when he had his experience with God. I mean, Isaiah was in the temple in a time of national mourning when you, the king Uzziah, died. He said, I went to the temple and I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Paul was on the Damascus Road. You see, God can turn the most commonplace into a spectacular shrine when you meet him at that place. It could be a desk, it could be a home, it could be a church. Finally, notice this. This Samaritan woman... Her whole life was changed when Jesus met her. Her life was changed. And I want you to notice, this is what Jesus says. I give. Salvation is a gift that is given to us by God. Jesus said, you don't need a rope to draw this living water. It's an everlasting supply, and you're never going to be thirsty again. You see, there is a restlessness within all of us until we come to rest in him. There is a longing for something more until we finally understand that that void in our life can only be met through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, a psychology class at Johns Hopkins uh, University stumbled across a 20-year-old study that had been done on a uh, part of a city in Baltimore, Maryland. So they stumbled across this this, uh, study that had taken place 20 years ago. What they had done was they had gone to this inner city place in, in Baltimore and they had interviewed countless children. And most of these children did not have fathers. Many of them were being raised in foster homes. A lot of them were being raised by single parents. The conclusion of that study suggested this, that 90 to 95 percent of those children interviewed from ages 3 to age 10, the majority of them would end up in prison or dead. So they find this study, and one of the professors takes it to his class, and he goes, here's a study that was done. I think we need to do a follow-up. We have the names, addresses. Let's go find out what happened to these kids that were interviewed 20 years ago. They go back, same section of town, Baltimore, Maryland. Of all the kids that were interviewed, you know how many were in prison? None. You know how many had been killed? None. Many of them were doctors, lawyers, teachers, and accountants. What the study that had been done 20 years ago didn't include was one lady. They called her Aunt Hannah. Aunt Hannah lived in that neighborhood. And Aunt Hannah's name, I mean, her her home became an oasis for troubled kids. Whenever a child would find difficulty in school, guess who tutored them? Aunt Hannah. When somebody had trouble at home, you know who encouraged them? Aunt Hannah. You don't think one person can make a difference in the routineness of life? Aunt Hannah changed an entire neighborhood and almost an entire generation. Today, You and I need to understand that people make an impact on our lives by what they do for us. 
Yesterday I was at uh, the Mississippi State baseball game. My brother drove down from Olive Branch, so I got to see him. I hadn't seen him much in the last couple of years. He's been over in Georgia. He's moved back to Mississippi now. And he was a great athlete, lettered in five sports in high school, played two sports in college. Pretty good. And I always wanted to be like him. Always wanted to be like him. He's five years older than me, but he's much bigger. Uh, I'm taller than him when I say he's bigger. He's, I'm deep, he's wide. <laughs> if we're going to do the song, deep and wide, you know, I, I'm deep, he's wide. And uh, I could see him sitting on the other side of the stadium and he's got two bad knees from a life of athletics, playing football. And when he walks down the steps, it, it, it's almost painful to watch. And I, I, I nudged Laura. I said, look at Uncle Pete walking down the steps. Look, he looks like he's 80 years old. Now I went down to go see him. And uh, when I got over there, he said, would you do me a favor? And I said, sure. He said, I left my cap and my cell phone up in the seat. Can you go up there and get it? And so I said, sure. And I go up there and make my way close to his seat. And I looked at this guy and said, is there a cap and a cell phone in that seat? And he said, yeah. I said, was a big fat guy sitting here? He said, yeah. I said, well, that's my brother. Would you pass the cap and phone down? So they pass it. And I went down and I gave it to him. And, and, and we told each other goodbye, and he hugged me. I kissed him on the cheek or the forehead, and, you know, right there in front of, you know, 13,000 folks, you know, I'm not really concerned with people think about my sexuality. I'm going to kiss my brother. And when he left, I started thinking about all the things he has taught me. Taught me how to put on a baseball uniform. Taught me how to hit a golf ball. But the most important thing that I will never forget was the day he got married. I was his best man. I was his best man. Wedding was taking place in Water Valley. He's this stud athlete, he's going for a senior year in college. Half the football team is there for his wedding. And this is what he says to me on the day of his wedding. He says, uh, you and I are going to spend the day together. Younger brother, high school, get to hang out with a cool guy, all of his friends. I said, I said well, let's do it. We go bowling. We don't even bowl. We went to the movie. But I never forgot that on the most important day other than salvation in his life, he spent time with me. What seems to be insignificant has eternal value was it your parent was it your teacher was it your sibling somebody met you in the routineness of life and changed everything for you Jesus wants to do the same today let's pray father we thank you today in the routineness of life, you can make a difference. You can make a difference where we are right now by challenging us and stimulating us to be more. Father, this is our prayer. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.